Thank you for joining us on Talking Hoosier Baseball, a podcast by fans from the iubase.com website for anyone wanting more information on Indiana University baseball. Today is Wednesday, September 12th, 2018. I'm Josh Bennett, joined by stats guru Cassidy Palmer, balk connoisseur Chris Feeney, master of the RPI Carl James, and tonight we have a very special guest, and there's only one way to introduce him. Hit it, DJ. I'm a scat man. Oh. <laughs> oh man. So Austin Candelosi wore number 18 for the Hoosiers from 2014 to 2017. And during that time, he hit 234 with 11 home runs in 164 games, 121 of those being starts. In his senior season, Austin hit 333 with runners in scoring position. And he had one of the closest first pitch looking versus swinging breakdowns that I've seen in two years of tracking this at 51% looking versus 49% swinging. And while he was at IU, he started games at five different positions that I could find, first base, second base, third base, DH. So Austin was kind of a jack of all trades. Well, welcome Austin to Talking Hoosier Baseball. And uh, so it's been a whirlwind 16 months for you. You had graduation, uh, your first coaching gig, and then your first head coaching gig in summer ball. Uh, can you walk us through what it's been like for you? I mean, it's been a whirlwind. I mean, I miss IU every day, obviously a little too much. The guys back at IU always make fun of me for how much I try to stay up with them and try to like live vicariously through them. But it's been, it's been, a, it's been a long road. I mean, I went in coaching, uh, loved it, had a great experience at the Citadel. Thanks to coach Lamonis, who actually uh, hooked me up down there coaching summer ball for my old man's team for the Pelicans. It was a great experience. And then now, uh, now working in the corporate world. So just like baseball, I'm a jack of all trades. So it's been a long, bumpy road. But uh, I'm I use really shaped me into what I'm doing these days, and I miss it every day. Wow. Well, uh, what have you learned uh, so far uh, about coaching that you you didn't know as a player? Um, the biggest thing I could take away from coaching was that as a, as a player, I thought coaches just kind of micromanage everything you did they they saw everything like if you didn't go four for four they were going to pull you out of the lineup or if you uh didn't get the game winning hit they were going to take you out of the lineup but that couldn't be farther from the case being on the coaching side they just see hey we really like how this kid goes about his business he's a good student he works hard in the weight room and he just he shows up every day ready to play and the perfect example i could give of that i'm sure you guys know him is tony butler he didn't light you up but man that kid just every day he did everything right Every single time, you knew what you're gonna get. Great teammate, great student, great in the weight room. That's the idea what coaches want. Yeah, you're gonna run into a few superstars, but uh, I think that just in the college ranks, that's what coaches really look for, and that's what I wish I knew back then because it would have took a lot of pressure off myself that I created. Thanks, Austin. It's Chris. I uh, wanted to say hello and thank you for joining us, man. This is a big, big thrill. I know you're a big fan favorite for a lot of people at the bar. Um, maybe not everybody knew, but we just want to let people know that your dad, John, you know, played MLB, uh, seven teams, if I'm correct. One certain team from Queens, I believe, uh, 1984, sure New York Mets. Unfortunately, Lazy Mary. Lazy Mary. See, you knew about it. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, he didn't get to finish the season, I guess, right? Because the 94 was the strike here. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so he should have had some couple more months playing at Shea. Uh, unfortunately, I guess he didn't get that. But uh, I noticed your birthday is 94. That's so, correct. Yeah. All right. So I'll do the math on that. December of 94 uh, for your birthday. And uh, so seven teams for John. How was it growing up as a uh, son of a major leader? Um, to be honest, I, I was just so young. I really don't remember him playing much. But I more so remember him coaching in the minor leagues and those ranks. But I to this day, I wish I was – maybe like eighth grade high school wish I could because I was hanging around some pretty big names like Barry Bonds uh Bobby Bonilla uh Van Slyke Rafael Palmero just those guys like helped me when I was a baby and like 
I didn't really care. I didn't, I didn't, I viewed him as like my godfather or some whatever, but I wish I got more out of it. But as the coaching uh, aspect, I was a little older. I got more out of it, but he was just, he was never around. And it was tough on me not having your dad there playing little league. But after he got done coaching and opened up his uh, facility here in Chicago, he was there every step of the way. You seen him at the IU games. He was always there and he was just always my biggest fan. Never forced the game on me, not hard on me at all. And he just, I think you would have supported me if I took up bass fishing as a hobby if uh, if I wanted to. But uh, he was just oh, he, he was just my he's my biggest fan, and I was very blessed to have him come up because our conversations at the dinner table were a little different than most. It was about mostly baseball about it, and then when you're about eight or nine years old talking about uh, hitting approaches, it's a it's a little different. <laughs> So, Austin, it's Cassidy. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about your favorite on-the-field memory while playing at IU? Favorite on-the-field memory. First of all, for you podcasters that don't know, Cassidy played a huge part in tutoring me in political science, (laughs) so I want to get that out there and thank her for that. (laughs) But um, my favorite on-the-field memory. There's so so many. Um, I would have to say... Besides from winning the uh, regular season Big Ten championship and then the tournament, I would have to say when Dilo hit that home run in the rain against Maryland, there was just – that was probably one of my favorite games. And I don't – I think I, had, I didn't even really play. But that just – we created that atmosphere. You know, they were talking smack all weekend. And then Craig Dilo just does what Craig Dilo does. The, the baby-faced assassin hits a grand slam in the pouring rain. It felt like I was in the natural when, I, when it happened. So that's going to be talked about for a long time. So I was just happy to be a part of it. And I actually got to see, I got to see Craig play down in Charleston. He's tearing it up. So if anyone's wondering about that, so <laughs> shout yeah, out to Deedlo. Yep. That's definitely a favorite memory amongst the fans too. That, that thing was nuts. Um, and so you, you had a very distinctive walk up song while you were there. Can you explain Scat Man and kind of the story behind I, that? I was hoping you'd ask this question. Um a lot I actually named myself, believe it or not. Um Evan Bell, we were on the plane to Arizona and he showed me this song. He goes, Can you check this song out? Just to be a joke, because we all know how bad the song is and I uh I listened to it and I'm like, yo Evan, like I think I'm the scat man. He goes <laughs> He goes, what are you talking about? I go, I'm the kid, I'm the scat man. And then I just kept calling myself that, and people were just like, dude, you can't, you can't nickname yourself. You can't, you can't do that. I go, well, I'm the scat man. And I go, if you don't believe me, change my walk-up song to the scat man in the middle of my freshman year, and it just, it stuck. And I think when we, when we played it for the, uh, for the opening scene here, that's the longest I've heard it because when you walk up to the play, you only hear like ten seconds of it. So, thank you for that. It's the longest I heard the song in years. <laughs> Oh, the best, the best. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm not going out on a limb here by saying that Austin was definitely a fan favorite and one of ours, each of us for sure, during your time donning the cream and crimson. But uh, there's a lot more to being a student athlete than just the game itself. So Austin, what was your favorite non-baseball memory from your time at IU that you're willing to share with us? So I'm sure there are some that you wouldn't want to share with us. And also, please keep in mind that this is a family-friendly show. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. My non, my favorite non-baseball memory. It's kind of has to do with baseball, but not really. So we in the la- my last game, we were down at Kentucky. Obviously, that forbidden game. We're in the we're in the uh, regional semifinal. Haven't been playing much my senior year. My second to last at bat, I hit a home run, but it wasn't the home run. My best friend since I was maybe maybe six or seven years old surprised me, took a road trip down with his buddies to Kentucky, and they were in the left field bleachers, and I hit this home run. And you know how you guys were there. You know the, how the center field had all the security? My buddy yep. hops his security gate. I'm pretty sure he almost ran over a small child to get my home run ball. <laughs> Awesome. The security guard was like, "Hey, like I promised that girl, I'd give her that ball." And the, my buddy's just like, "I I drove I drove five hours to see this kid hit, so he got my home run ball." 
and I pointed at him. We were down 10 to 4, but I, I pointed at him in the left field bleachers when I was rounding second. But then after the game, he gave me the ball, and I was able to actually give it to my mom, and I'm pretty sure it's uh, still sitting in her closet. So I'm happy she was able to have that and just a little memento. But uh, that was really special. That gives me goosebumps talking about it. Yeah, that, that would be awesome to be able to give your mom your last home run ball. That's That's pretty cool. So uh, what made you choose to come to Bloomington for college? And can you share a little bit with us about what so, went into that decision? I wasn't heavily recruited, really, out of high school. I was in a high-end guy. And obviously, my my senior year where I committed, the year they went to the World Series. So besides Schwarber was a, was a diamond in the rough. No one gave him the respect he deserved. Sam Travis, Chris Soika guys from my area who just blue nose blue collar players went there so i hate to say it they weren't getting these five star recruits so tracy smith was just recruiting some hard nosed dudes that knew how to play baseball and went in the game and then obviously shorber and travis became superstars but anyways those guys are from my area i uh tracy was just r- straight up with me since day 1 he said in the office you know how tracy is he's just not going to sugarcoat it he goes Hey, I think you could play. I think you play for me right now, but if you come here this fall and you don't perform and you don't put your, give yourself a reason to get in the lineup, I, you're not going to play. He didn't promise me anything. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He didn't butter me up to get me to come there. He just he saw my ability. He wanted me to fit into his system, and I respected that. And then obviously Bloomington in itself is an awesome place, and I just fell in love with the campus. They were getting the new stadium, but – when I got on campus, I just fell in love with so much more. The just you guys and you guys. I to my girlfriend, my girlfriend, she's listening right now. She's probably sick of it. I always talk about it. I go, hey, did they just? It was home. It was. A, I go to the stadium and just talk to the fans like they were. They are my neighbors. That's. I feel like you don't have that anywhere else in the country, and that's for everybody, not just for me. Austin, after your freshman year, um, and you kind of you know you, you talked here about uh, about Tracy Smith, um, you know he, he after your freshman year he left for a, for a college blue blood program. Um, several Hoosier players right now are in that same boat. So can you describe what that transition was like for you, and what advice you'd give for the the current teammates who are uh, who are going through that? Yeah, it was a it was an awkward transition. I found out actually playing in summer ball that Tracy left and it was just more tough on me because we had a really good relationship. We still do. I'm really good friends with his son, Tyler Smith. And it was just tough because he, Tracy had really helped me grow up. So I was more so sad that that relationship was gone. So I was kind of nervous that, you know, Chris Lamonis came in. And I don't know if we're going to have the same relationship fit into the same system. If he was going to give guys a fair shake that were there, but he came in and, he, he took the program to new heights, the same thing that Tracy did. And I think with these guys with the new staff, you just – you can't really think the way I did because it puts added pressure on yourself. Where I was thinking like, oh, Coach Lamonis is coming here. What's going to happen? And it's just – you can't control that. You can't control what they're going to do. And then in the long run, whenever a coaching crisis just happens, they're coming to just keep that same uh, that same culture. Because Indiana baseball, we win. We win, period. It, the – the numbers don't lie. We're in regional last four four out of the five years or three out of the four years. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but they want that culture to stay so that no one's going to come in and change it. So I think the players just can't put that pressure on themselves. They can't put worry about them not getting a fair shake because they are. I mean, that's it's one of the best programs in the nation. Probably better. It's a lot better than when I left it, and I could not be more proud of those guys. The uh, Matt Lloyds. Grant Sloan's, Matt Gorski, Jeremy Houston, those guys are just some tough ball players and they grew up quick, a lot quicker than I had to do it. And I don't think a coaching staff's gonna defer them from that. The uh it's really up to the locker room and how they respond to it and how they how are they gonna keep that tradition going and I do not have any doubts of that happening. So it's gonna be a hell of a season and it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting. It's just the only difference is there's a new guy at the helm. That's really it. 
well, now that you're a year removed from playing, uh, you know, what advice would you give to a high school kid who is thinking about uh, playing uh, major college baseball? Um, high school kid. I would say um, really – so I'm I'm, just, I'm going off something that I struggle with. You really just for Division One baseball, it's, it's it's a job. It really is. I loved every second of it, but if you're going into it that uh, I kind of want to do it, I kind of want to just be able to say I played Division One baseball. I want to have the the big stadiums, the lights. That's that just not that's just not what it's about. It's just something bigger than yourself, and with something bigger than yourself, you're going to have to put the work in, and it's tough. The workouts, the class, the uh, the workouts, the class, the performance, it all has to be the best. And if you're not giving anything other than your best, you're cheating the program and you're cheating yourself. So and I think Indiana does a really good job of stressing that. When Coach Lamonis came in and Tracy came in, they just first said, if I can't trust you in the classroom, I can't trust you on the field. So I, I obviously wasn't a good student in high school and I – my myself set fault for that I didn't put in the time and my dad sat me down and said if you really want to play college baseball you're gonna have to put in the work in the classroom in the weight room and I think high school guys just need to check themselves and see if this is what they really want because division one baseball players they're different and same thing with basketball same thing with football all people all the the non-athletes see is they see the big stadiums. They see us going to championships. They see us flying on planes. They're like, oh, man, that's easy. They do whatever they want. They get the nice gear. But they don't see that we're up at 5 o'clock in the morning doing weights. We're traveling to California, getting back at Sunday night at 3 in the morning, and then they're stressing. If you're not in 8 a.m. class the next day, you're on the Versa Climber praying to God that you could get off it anytime soon. <laughs> so it's just <clears throat> all in retrospect, you, you got to know what you're getting into and that's that's something that was a culture shock to me my freshman year. That's something I struggle with to answer your if that answers your question. Oh yeah. So Austin, as we start to wrap this interview up, uh, we've got to ask you. We all want to know what's what's the next step. What are you up to right now? You mentioned something about your corporate life. So that's that's right. So actually, I'm I'm done at the Citadel. I um I had a great experience there. Um, my family, the Bass family, the family I stay with, actually listening right now. I want to give them a hello. They were just a family that welcomed me with open arms, made me feel at home in Charleston while I was working, and they took me in like I was their son. So I'm happy I was able to get that relationship. But it was just, it was tough on me. Uh, the volunteer life, you're not getting paid, and you're working 70, 80 hours a week. It was great being at the field, but my girlfriend and I are. I wanted to see my girlfriend. We're getting serious going on a year dating. And I just, I really didn't want to put in five, six years before I got a paid job. And if you're on the fence about coaching, just like playing, you got to take a step back because it's not fair to the guys, to the university that you're at, because you're not giving them everything you had. And so I'm actually working as a relationship banker at a JP Morgan Chase right now, getting my licensing for that. And then hopefully that's not what I want to do the rest of my life on the side. My real goal is I want to be a Chicago police officer. So I'm going to take the test in December. So that's on my plate right now, but you'll be the first if anything changes with that. Excellent, man. We, we wish you the best of luck in it. You uh, evidently, you obviously have your head screwed on right and your priorities straight. And, and I'm, I'm sure it's hard to walk away from the game, but uh, I think you've got it figured out. Absolutely. And, and one last thing I've got to say, you, you talked about your favorite memory um, being the Didalo Grand Slam. But uh, one of my favorite IU baseball memories was what came right after that. Uh, I'll always remember the fire you came out with and the exchange that you had with the dugout right after that. Uh, I think you showed us what passion you had for the game and what a great teammate and, and leader you were. We all enjoyed watching you play and thank you for all of those getting up at four in the morning, three in the morning and, and doing all that work. Cause it, you were, you were a special guy to watch. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you guys. I mean, you, you made it worth it all. And uh, I mean, you just ran or shine. If I was hitting 
200 or 100 cast. I think you said I swung at 50% first pitches. So young guys don't, don't do that. That's probably why I struck out a lot. But uh, anyways, just, I just want to say thank you to you guys, man. You guys are just, you guys are awesome. You don't understand how much you guys are appreciated by the whole athletic community. And from the bottom of my heart, my family, we all love you guys. And uh, I miss you guys. So October 12th, count on me being there. I better see you, Chris. I don't know, Chris. I better see you, Cassidy. I better we'll see be all there. you guys. All right. Oh yeah, absolutely. We'll be there. Good to hear all from right. you, Scott. Man, uh, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Go Hoosiers. Hey, Austin, we really appreciate you being on the podcast and catching up with us. And again, we wish you luck in your future endeavors and and uh, keep us posted on your progress. Uh, and we, of course, we'd love to have you on for an update in the future. Absolutely. You know where to find me. All right. So that will do it for this special edition of Talking Hoosier Baseball. Please read up on indianabaseball.iubase.com. You can follow us on Twitter at CU at the BART and at IUBase17. So for Cassidy Palmer, Carl James, Chris Feeney, and Mr. Austin Cangelosi, I'm Josh Bennett. We'll see you at the BART. All right. See you guys.